Hi, and welcome to lesson four, unit eight of um, our class called Revolution and Reform. Uh, in this lesson, we'll be discussing something historians call the communication revolution, which is really related to the industrial revolution, uh, but focuses specifically on how people are able to talk to each other and communicate with each other in the early 19th century. As always, let's start things off with a hook question. During the Great Hunger, when millions of Irish were starving, what group of Americans raised money for famine relief? You're probably not going to believe this, but in fact, the Choctaw Indians, a group of people that had been forcibly removed by Andrew Jackson uh, to settle in Oklahoma, and a group of people who were themselves oppressed and themselves suffering greatly. The Choctaw were able to scrape some money together and some goods to send all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the Irish, who, as we talked about in previous lessons, were starving and suffering horribly. So it's an amazing story of people from different walks of life and different parts of the world uh, recognizing the common humanity in each other. Speaking of somebody who did not recognize the common humanity in each other, this is Andrew Jackson, of course, standing tall and proud during the uh, Battle of New Orleans, where he and some uh, a motley crew of American soldiers defeated a much larger British force. This is one of the battles that made Andrew Jackson's political career but it was also a strange battle because it was fought actually after the peace treaty of Ghent between the British and the Americans had already been signed. Uh, we talked about this earlier. It's one of those strange quirks of American history. And um, it can be explained by one simple fact. Communication, when Andrew Jackson was fighting in the War of 1812, was slow. In fact, um, Communication during the War of 1812 used the same technology and the same techniques as um, individuals communicated with each other over 2,000 years earlier when Alexander the Great was trying to conquer the, the world. Um, basically, for thousands of years, people had been communicating with each other through the same methods. Writing down messages and then handing those messages to people who might get on top of a pony and travel to the location as quickly as possible. So the speed of communication during this time really was uh, based off of the speed of boats and the speed of horses. So Europe had already kind of been undergoing kind of a communication revolution, even in the Middle Ages. I'm sure you've heard of Johannes Gutenberg's famous Gutenberg Press. This really did revolutionize the spreading of texts around uh, Europe. Um, prior to the Gutenberg printing press, all um, books and texts were written by hand. Um, the press enabled books to be more rapidly created and sold so that they were relatively affordable for uh, upper class, well-to-do folks in Europe. So after this printing press, basically everybody in Europe um, owned at least one book, and that book was the Bible. Still, the printing press, even though it made uh, creating texts and, and manuscripts faster, it still did take time. It still was, after all, a manual machine. So um, we talked about during the Industrial Revolution how new power sources were used uh, to power existing technologies and to create systems and machines that could mass produce products and make those products more affordable. And a, an inventor in German, another German printer named Friedrich Koenig, invented the steam-powered printing press. And as you can imagine, the steam-powered printing press basically produced text five times faster uh, than could be done with manual presses based off of Gutenberg's printing press at the time. As you can imagine, being able to produce text so much quicker um, enabled the price of texts like newspapers and broadsides, etc., to drop substantially. So during this time period, pretty much anybody could afford to buy a newspaper. Why newspapers came to be called the penny press because at the end of the day they were dirt cheap since more and more and more people could afford to buy newspapers newspapers didn't just contain stories that would be interesting to rich people like the business pages and investments options etc locations like the new york sun 
published stories and they published sensational um, stories about political uh, drama and um, scandal. Uh, publications began publishing fashion uh, advice columns and ladies advice columns and, and whole magazines specifically geared towards men and women and children. Lithographers also began publishing beautiful images that uh, really uh, painted an, an interesting picture of America as it was growing and developing in the pre-Civil War period. And if all these newspapers and all of these magazines and if all of these new kinds of publications were being published and were uh, affordable for the mass population, uh, and they also this also led to a huge growth in, you probably guessed it already, advertising. At the end of the day, these kinds of newspapers, yeah, they made money through subscriptions and they made money by selling uh copies to individuals on street corners, but they really made their money uh, with uh, through ad revenue. These are some really interesting examples of early advertisements and early uh, lithographs um, in the early 19th century. <clears throat> so bottom line, the steam-powered printing press made an enormously diverse variety of written materials more accessible and affordable to the American masses. And this had enormous social impact, as we'll learn in our fifth and final lesson for this unit. But we've talked an awful lot about the written word, but there was an enormous advance in communication in the early 19th century that had absolutely nothing to do with text. And that invention has been attributed to none other than the famous Samuel F.B. Morse. And I'm sure you've heard of Morse code before. And if you take a peek at this image, you can see the invention uh, that Samuel Morse is well known for. So since Samuel Morse was an inventor, clearly that was his number one job. If that's what you think, you would be wrong. Believe it or not, Samuel Morse was a painter. Not a very successful one, but a very good one. This famous picture of James Monroe was painted by none other than Samuel F. B. Morse. Morse also painted this picture of a famous Revolutionary War hero in his 50s from France. You guessed it. This is a painting of Mar the Marquis de Lafayette in his elder years. There's an interesting story associated with this painting. As Morse was painting it, he got a message that his wife had fallen ill. Morse hurriedly traveled back to his hometown to uh, see if he could help um, get his wife feeling better. But by the time that he made it home, his wife was already dead and in the ground. This event had a huge impact on Morse's life. He vowed that he would somehow find a way, a new technological solution that would make communication faster for Americans and for people around the world. And so he went to Europe and learned a little bit about something called electromagnetism to come up with a really, really good idea um, for a machine to send electromagnetic messages over long distances. And that machine, of course, was the famous telegraph. Now, I know this doesn't look like a particularly impressive device, but I would argue that the telegraph is more important than the internet when it comes to um, dramatically transforming the way the world worked. The telegraph was a device that used electrical signals to send messages, and those messages could be sent almost instantaneously over great distances. You know, it's kind of funny because a lot of people assume that the telegraph was 100% invented by Samuel Morse, and that the famous Morse code was invented by him as well not the brunt of the work and most of the heavy lifting was actually done by his assistant a man named alfred vale alfred vale was just really 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 thrilled to have the opportunity to tinker around in a lab and so when samuel morris asked him to do so uh, for some wages vale readily agreed and they signed a contract that contract really kind of doomed vale's um, prospects of becoming a rich man. Because in that contract, it said that anything that Vale came up with would belong to Samuel Morse. And any patent uh, that Samuel Morse signed would only have Morse's name on it. So it was actually Alfred Vale that came up with a lot of the technological improvements uh, that went into the first telegraph machine. 
And it was also Vail who actually invented the famous Morse code. Originally, Samuel uh, Morris wanted to create a system where every single word in the English language had a corresponding number attached to it. So cat was number 36 and xylophone was number 762 and uh, butter was number two, let's just say. Anywho, in order to basically decode any message using this system, the telegraph operator would have to use a giant book of hundreds and hundreds of pages, kind of like a dictionary, to look up what each code coded number meant. Vail thought this was stupid because it, it was stupid. And he came up with a much better system where every single letter in the um, English language, all 26 of the letters of the alphabet, had their own codes dots, and dashes. Um, Alfred Vail uh, presented this code system to Morris, and he agreed to um, publish it in their patent. This was the famous Morse code. Ultimately, Samuel Morris ended up making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of his invention because his name was on the patent. Alfred Vail made nothing. So sometimes capitalism is not that fair to the inventors who produce amazing inventions for the American people and for the world. Anyway, this is a really good video that shows how the telegraph works. I'm not going to play it right now, but like I always do, every single one of these uh, videos will be available in the slideshow that I will also attach to Classroom at the end of this lesson. So the telegraph worked because telegraph wires were strung up connecting two separate machines. And since the telegraph messages were transmitted electronically, as long as the signal could travel through a conductor, well, that, sig that signal would travel virtually instantaneously over great, great distances. This is a really good lithograph, actually, showing um, folks raising poles uh, to create kind of a telegraph line um, for that very purpose. It doesn't, it won't come as a surprise to you guys. The telegraph lines really took off across America, particularly as you can see in this map in the Northeast. This might surprise you though. This right here is a map showing the submarine telegraph. Um, in the 1860s, people actually had the idea to literally string a cable from Newfoundland all the way to Ireland. The first cable, not so successful. However, subsequent cables actually worked. And if you look over in the lower le uh, left-hand corner of this uh, image, you can see just how thick that cable was. Guess what those cables were made out of? You guessed it. Copper and Montanans. Where do you suppose all of that copper came from that went into these massive, massive cables that connected the world together for the first time with an instantaneous communication technology? Well, many of you might have guessed it, Butte America, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the invention of the telegraph played an enormous role in the economic demand for, co uh, for copper and for the growth of cities in Western states, particularly Butte. Butte, has, Butte was at this time pretty much the number one uh, mine yielding copper that the world used for their telegraph lines. Anyway, I hope you learned a lot about the uh, tele the communication revolution that took place in the early 19th century. Um, our final lesson for this unit will tie all of these pieces together, the communication revolution, a religious revolution, as well as the industrial revolution, and argue that all of these things came together to produce a wave of social reform. Thank you very much and have a good day.